2024 City Council meeting to order. Thank you those who are joining us in the audience and those who are joining us remotely. At this time, as with every meeting, we begin with the invocation and prayer. Ask that Pastor Cartwright from the Power of Christian Faith Church would come forth, give us the invocation. We ask that all would please stand for the prayer, after which let's repeat the Pledge of Allegiance in unison. Pastor Cartwright, how are you? Good evening. To the mayor, officers, and the members of the city, Fayetteville City Council and community at large, grace and peace be unto you in the spirit of Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Now, Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Spirit of the living God, we come now in the blessed name of Jesus Christ as we assemble at this appointed date and time. As we fall of the canopy of grace to be with the Fayetteville City Council, I pray, O oh God, that you move with your compassionate hand over the mayor, the city council members, the city staff, the residents, and all of the city stakeholders that love and abide under this wonderful city called Fayetteville, North Carolina. Lead them, Lord God. Guide them, Lord God. Move with your compassionate hand. Give them the wisdom, the knowledge, the spiritual sermon, understanding as they serve the greater good and the needs of our beloved city where you will get the glory, dear Father, out of all that we say and do. It's in the name of the Father, the Son, the Blessed Holy Spirit. I do pray and ask it all in the children of God say, Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Pastor Scott Wright, we certainly appreciate you, sir, and we are very familiar with you, but if you could just use this moment to kind of tell us a little bit about yourself and your yes, yes, sir, ministry. I'd be glad to, uh, Mayor. I am uh, Dr. Lionel Cartwright. I received my doctorate up at Campbell University. Also received my master's there, and I'm an alum of the University of Maryland up in Baltimore. Uh, I'm a resident of Fayetteville over 35, 36 years. I'm a retiree, CW Chief Warrant Officer 5 in the United States Army. I did 35 years and 10 days to be exact. Uh, I take pride in what it is I can do as a co-laborer and a stakeholder in the city of Fayetteville. I am concerned about the health and well-being of our city, and I pledge to the mayor I just call and whatever I can do to assist. I'm more than glad to do that. I provide uh, pastoral care counseling, crisis intervention, suicide intervention. I'm a certified mediator, and I'm available to help. What I currently do now is provide crisis intervention support and suicide intervention counseling to families in crisis. I take pride in it, love it, anything I can do for the city. And uh, city manager, you know me, and I'm glad to see you again. And that's my part in contrib cont contributions to the city, sir. Well, Pastor Cartwright, I, I appreciate that. Thank you for always being uh, willing to, to serve and to come uh, and share your evening with us tonight. And thank you for your service to the thank community. You, uh, Council, as we move to announcements, uh, we have any announcements? I know we have a couple of proclamations. You going to do it now? Oh, sir. sir. Oh, okay. All right. I'll go to Council Member Benevente. He has a special presentation. Thank you, Mayor Colvin. Uh, in recognition of Pride Month, I'd like to ask for Crystal Maddox to please come to the front. Uh, Mayor Colvin, if you could um, be so kind as to um, relay the uh, contents of the proclamation. Yes, sir. Good evening. Good evening. So I've uh, premier, prepared a proclamation for, from the Office of the Mayor on behalf of the City Council and the citizens of Fayetteville, and it reads as follows. Whereas the United States was found on the ideals of equality, inclusion, and respect for all, but the realization of these ideals has been long delayed and often only obtained after years, decades, and centuries of struggle, culminating in civil rights legislation or rulings, including, included for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer, and questioning LGBTQ Americans, and whereas the month of June 2024 marks 55 years since the Stonewall Uprising, wherein the LGBTQ citizens of a variety of ages and racial and ethnic backgrounds rose up against oppressive laws 
and policing tactics that have been since found to be unconstitutional. And whereas the Stonewall Uprising is widely considered the beginnings of the modern LGBTQ civil rights movement and the LGBTQ pride celebrations have occurred in June all around the country every year since then. And whereas June is nationally recognized as Pride Month, and whereas Fayetteville has a diverse LGBTQ population with a rich and varied history that includes people of all ethnicities, languages, religions, and professions, and whereas everyone should be able to live a life free and f from fear, hatred, and discrimination, whether it be based on race, religion, gender identity, sexual orientation, age, national origin, or veteran status. And whereas the achievements of the LGBTQ community will be celebrated in Fayetteville at Fayetteville's Pride Annual Fest on June 24, 2024, now, therefore, I, Mitch Colvin, Mayor of the City of Fayetteville, North Carolina, and on behalf of the City Council and more than 208,000 citizens, do hereby honorably proclaim the 24th day of June in the year 2024 to be in honor of Fayetteville Annual Pride Fest. As witness thereof, I have set my hand to cause the great city, seal of the City of Fayetteville, to be affixed this 24th day of June 2024. <laughs> Mr. Mayor, we want to thank you first and foremost. We want to invite all of you council members and guests. We want to let you know at Fayetteville Pride, we're not prejudiced, we don't judge, we don't hate. We invite everybody, even straight people, you're welcome. We will not judge you. Our festival is Saturday the 29th. It is a family-oriented event in Festival Park. It starts at 12 o'clock. It will end at 6 o'clock. There will be activities for children, youth, all family members. Of course, being Pride, there will be a drag show. There will be drag queens at 1 o'clock and 3 o'clock. Family-friendly numbers. But again, please know everyone is welcome. We promise not to judge you, hold anything against you. Men and women may kiss. You may hold hands. <laughs> we will not get upset. <laughs> Thank you, Crystal. If at Thank this time, you. Crystal, <laughs> feel free to ask everyone to come up front. Perhaps we can take a photo as well. Come on up. In three, one, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. All right. I was doing good till it kept shifting down. The heads kept getting all. I was like, okay. All right. Thank you, Councilmember Benavente. Thank you, uh, Crystal Maddox for and company for uh, helping us to recognize that. We are a diverse community, so diversity certainly is our strength here in the city. As we move to the next item, we have a proclamation been pre prepared uh, this past weekend or this past week uh, represented uh, Juneteenth, a uh, federally recognized holiday in the, in the United States as well as was recognized here in, uh, in the city of Fayetteville. And I have a proclamation that has been prepared and it reads as follows, whereas Juneteenth commemorates June 19th, 1865, the day when Union soldiers arrived in Galveston, Texas, with the news that the Civil War had ended and enslaved African Americans were free. And whereas Juneteenth celebrates the emancipation of enslaved African Americans and recognizes the historical significance of this day in our nation's journey towards equality and justice. And whereas Juneteenth serves as a reminder of the resilience and contributions of African Americans to our communities, culture, and nation, whereas Juneteenth provides an opportunity to reflect on our shared history, reaffirm our commitment to promoting freedom and equality and justice for all. Now, therefore, I, Mitch Colvin, Mayor of the City of Fayetteville, North Carolina, on behalf of the City Council and more than 208,000 citizens, do hereby proclaim the 19th day of June 2024 is Juneteenth here in Fayetteville. And I encourage uh, all residents of the city who have, since this has passed, 
uh, to commemorate this day with the appropriate activities and celebrations that honor the sacrifices and achievements of African Americans throughout history. Let us use this occasion to foster unity, understanding, and mutual respect among all people. And with that, I'll go to Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, on June 12th, I had the honor of speaking to about 300 women veterans. And June, for those of you that do not know, June 12th is veteran Mayor, uh, is Women's Veterans Day, and Fayetteville has made a proclamation for that day, and we have recognized that day, and North Carolina has too. So that's a great achievement for our women veterans. So with that being said, I was going to see if there was any women veterans. Did they come? They had told me that they might come, but the mayor had um, done a proclamation, so I'm going to read the proclamation for our women veterans in the symposium that they did. Come on up. Come on up. I'm going to present it to you. If we have any women veterans in, would you please come? Hello. Hello. All right. Um, it was a special day. All right. All right. Well, thank you for that, uh, Mayor Pro Tem. So with this, a, a proclamation has been prepared for uh, the contribution that women have made to our military and to our country, and it reads as follows. Whereas the 2024 Military Women's Health Symposium underscores the increasingly vital role of women in the United States Armed Forces, uh, Armed Services, encompassing leadership and expanding combat roles and the rising numbers of service women. And whereas this annual gathering serves as a pivotal platform dedicated to advancing health care for women in the military, fostering collaboration among the military, VA, and community health care providers, alongside service women, women veterans, advocates, and support organizations, and whereas the symposium acts as a bridge seamlessly connecting active duty to veterans and the community health care system, fostering a collective expertise that acknowledges and addresses the distinctive needs and health conditions prevalent among military women. Now, therefore, I, Mitch Colvin, Mayor of the City of Fayetteville, North Carolina, on behalf of the City Council and more than 208,000 citizens, do hereby proclaim the seventh day of June in the year 2024 in honor of military women's health. And I have hereunto set my hand with the great seal of the City of Fayetteville to be affixed this 28th day of May 2024. Thank you, ladies. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you to the ladies, uh, all of the women in the military that have sacrificed to serve this country. We thank you. And uh, this is just a small token of our appreciation for your service. At this time, Council, as we move to the announcements, do we have any other announcements? Okay, seeing none. Uh, we'll move now to uh, the city manager's report. Mr. Hewitt. Uh, thank you, Mayor and, and members of Council. Um, no big report tonight, just uh, advising and asking the citizens to go to the city's website and to sign up for the city manager's report. You can find it at the top of the city's um, webpage, and it is accessed at fayetteville.nc.gov. That's all there. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hewitt. Uh, with that, Council, we'll move to the approval of the agenda, and I know there were uh, some amendments to that, so I'll entertain a motion. Council Member Benevente. Uh, my understanding is we will approve the agenda and then we'll make those, uh, pull that, Attorney Pulliam? No, we'll, we'll ask to pull it now. Okay. Uh, in that case, uh, Mayor Colvin, I'll ask that we move um, consent item number 7.0A14 to the 7.0B list and then move to approve the rest of the agenda. All right. Was any other modifications? Uh, Council Member Banks McLaughlin, you had your light on? Okay, so there's a motion by Councilmember Benevente to approve with the changes that were discussed, seconded by 
Council Member Banks McLaughlin, any discussion on the motion? All right, Council, I'll look to you for your votes, the agenda approval. And we have Council Member Hare on the line. Council Member Hare, what's your pleasure Green, on this sir. item? Green. All right. And welcome, Council Member Hare. So, Madam Clerk, uh, that is unanimous by those voting, including Council Member Hare, who is joining us remotely. Uh, as we move to uh, the consent section, 7.0 items, uh, that, uh, Council Member Benevente, I think you had your light pressed. No? Okay. I'll just move that we approve the consent agenda. All right. There's a motion by Council Member Benevente uh, to approve. Second it. Huh? Just approve the approval of the agenda. All right, there's a motion by Council Member Benevente, seconded by Council Member Thompson. Uh, any discussion on the motion for consent? 7.08 items. All right, Council, I look to you for your votes on that. Green, Mayor. Okay. What's, what's wrong? I was going to make a motion one more time. <laughs> uh, okay, motion First. carries there. All right, Council Member Benevente. Yes, sir, Mayor Cole. I understand that we're moving to the 7.0 B items. Yes. Well, in that case here, um, Mr. Mayor, um, I move that we approve the request for legal representation of city employees, but additionally we um, direct our city staff to um, establish a sentinel event review process, um, and if need be, you know, reaching out to our attorney general's office for assistance or reaching out to some past partners that have assisted us, um, such as NACOL. Um, <clears throat> so that would be my motion today, sir. All right, so it is to approve the item. Yes, sir. With, the, with also instructions to reach out to plan for the recommended review uh, that the Attorney General gave about a particular case. Is that it? That's correct, um, Mayor Colvin. I think moving forward, though, the Sentinel event review process will assist us with many types of situations. Um, I believe there's a situation even, you know, that's on Facebook now that a lot of folks are talking about. Um, we can do a lot to establish better practices moving forward. Um, so, you know, I want us to take the advice of, um, you know, folks at, you know, the highest levels of um, review and, and, and that we establish a Sentinel event review process here in Fayetteville. All right. So... so there's a motion to approve, which this item is to cover legal representation, but there, the uh, add-on was to have staff reach out. Mr. Hewitt, do you, do you all need any other clarity about uh, the last part of this motion? No, sir. We would um, come back um, once we were able to identify what was um, required. All right. So there's a motion by Council Member Benavente. Is there a second? Seconded by Council Member Green or, or Mayor Pro Tem. Was that your second? All right, so second by Council Member Green. Discussion, Council, uh, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you. Uh -oh. we, we should not be voting yet. Uh, and she's waiting to, to uh, let me see if I can turn you on. Thank you. Um, so I, I am, I'm, I'm questioning, I, I guess on the consent agenda, it said, are we going to approve representation? And then we're adding on is, can we amend it that we do one and then add the other, or does it have to be all one? Because, um, I'm open to splitting it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So you make a revised motion, uh, for Absolutely, consideration Mr. Mayor. of these two. Um, well, I guess in that case, the first motion I'll make, and I'll just ask, you know, for permission to make a second motion afterwards is to approve the um, request to provide legal representation. All right. Is the motion, does your second stand with that, Councilman Green? All right. All right. Any further discussion? And this is for legal representation. representation. Council, I'll look to you for your votes. Uh, Council Member Hare? Green, Mayor. All right. All right. Madam Clerk, that is uh, unanimous by those voting. And Mayor Cole, if I can be recognized once more. Yes, um, I'd like to make a motion at this time that we direct our city staff to establish a sentinel event review process here in Fayetteville. Was it to establish the process or to re reach out to the AG's office to understand or get bring the information to establish the process? Were you trying to cover the establishment of it in one motion or was it direction for staff? Well, I certainly would want our staff to reach out to the appropriate parties, but I, I, my understanding from the conversations that we've all had about this is that we're 
at a point where we are open to having such sentinel event reviews because the intention is not to place blame or to create uh, additional um, you know, situations where, where folks are, are harangued, but rather we want to improve our processes. Um, so, you know, I, I will ask again that we establish an event, central event review process and that we approach the appropriate partnerships uh, to get us to that point. All right. Is the motion by Councilmember Benevente as stated? Is there a second? Councilmember Banks McLaughlin, is that your second? Second by Councilmember Banks McLaughlin. Any discussion on the motion? All right, Council, I'll look to you for your votes. Uh, Council Member Hare. Rick. All right. All right. So motion carries 7-3. Seven, seven, uh, those voting in opposition, Mayor Pro Tem Jensen, Council Member Thompson, and Council Member Hare. Uh, Madam Clerk, you got all of that? All right. All right. Uh, moving forward, Council, as we move to the eight point items of the public hearings, I would ask uh, that uh, we you would give permission for a recusal. Um, can't present the motion, but I would ask that uh, motion and second be made to vote for a recusal so that I can step away from the eight point items that pertain. Second on that, Mayor. Or, or whoever, yeah, I guess. So you could wrap that up in the motion. Uh -huh. Mr. Mayor, I, I move to recuse you from 8.03 and 8.04. Council Member, Member Green oh, as well? Yes. Can you amend that motion? Oh, okay. I was going to make two separate motions. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. Okay. All right. Is a motion by Council Member Hondras? I'll second, second, Mr. Mayor. Second by Council Member Thompson. Any discussion on the motion? All right. Council, look to you for your votes, and I, I won't vote on the recusal. If it passes. <clears throat> yeah. Green, Mayor. Andres. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Um, I move to recuse Council Member Green from the same uh, 8.03 and 8.04. A second by Council Member Davis. Any discussion, Council Member Green? Yes, thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. I'd just like to state that I spoke with the city attorney earlier today, and as the president of a local corporation that owns a property in the Locks Creek subdivision, I received um, a letter informing me of this action outside of the city council um, in my role in that, in that manner. And based on my counsel from the city attorney and um, that I may be considered to have knowledge um, in that capacity and the concern that I couldn't make an unbiased decision. So I had been advised um, and taken that advice and um, asked to be recused. All right, any other questions? Okay, we're ready to vote. Green, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Council Member here. That is unanimous for those who are voting. Did, I'm sorry. No, you're good. I was going to wait for your vote to finish. Did mine not go up? No, everybody's. Okay. So I just wanted to um, clarify that Council mem uh, Member Hondros' motion for the mayor was just 8.03 and 8.04. So, Mayor, you can preside over 8.01 and 8.02 and vote. It's just the 8.03 and 8.04 that you will be recused from. Um, yes, so do come on back up. Back to work. <laughs> All right. Well, moving to 8.01, um, Council, as we prepare now for the public hearing, 
We're going to hold the public hearing where the city council formally seeks your input. Individuals desiring to speak in the hearing must have signed up to speak with the city clerk by name and address before the beginning of tonight's meeting. We will begin with the staff presentation. We'll then move into the formal hearing. 15 minutes will be allowed for all sides, those in favor and those opposed of the item. Individual speakers are limited to three minutes each, unless by previous arrangement a single spokesperson is designated, in which case the spokesperson may use the entire 15 minutes. When the city clerk calls your name, please come to the podium. Clearly state your name and address for the record. You may then begin to address the council. When the light changes from green to amber, it means you have 30 seconds remaining, and then the timer or the light will turn red at the end of your allotted time. So with that, I'll stop and give it over to you, Mr. Harmon. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and members of council. Uh, the first public hearing we have for you tonight is an annexation. This is uh, 2401, first one uh, here in the year 2004. Uh, the owner and applicant uh, is uh, Judd Brooks, LLC. Uh, the official address of the property is Angela M. Street, 2246. Uh, but the property is a little more easily defined as the intersection of Highway 24 and Whitehead Road. So it's a little ways uh, heading east out Highway 24. A uh, little over three, about three and a half acres uh, for the total property, and this is in District 2, or would will be in District 2 if approved. Um, at the start, during your consent items, uh, you already pre-approved the zoning for this, which would be light industrial. Uh, the property is currently used by Bobcat. Uh, they sell equipment out there. Uh, they are looking to come into the city to hook into the city's uh, water and sewer utilities. Uh, and as I said, you can kind of see where this is located. The, there are couple of patches of city limits uh, both to the east and west of it uh, but it is out Highway 24. Uh, and this is just a survey of the piece of property in question. Uh, again just the uh, zoning out there again it is currently in the county it's currently zoned for manufacturing in the county so it would be coming into the city under a like zoning. Um, our future land use plan calls for industrial uh, on this particular property as well, all that purple there. A uh, couple of photos, this is the, the existing property again, it's, it's an existing business. Uh, they sell equipment out there, Bobcat equipment. A uh, couple of things, uh, photos of everything around it, uh, most of the stuff around it are industrial in nature just like this uh, particular use is. Uh, again, just uh, showing where the property is located there, kind of three roads all the way around it. And uh, planning staff and the Zoning Commission uh, recommend approval uh, of this uh, draft ordinance uh, for Annexation 2401. Uh, petition does meet the requirements of the North Carolina General Statutes uh, and the <clears throat> real estate development, real estate department uh, for the city has verified the determination that the petition is sufficient. Uh, departments and divisions uh, report that they can absorb the expansion of services with minimal additional resources. Uh, and the annexation will lead to an increase in property taxes due to inclusion into the city's uh, taxes. Uh, and then those are your options uh, for adoption. Of course, you can set the adoption date for today. You can do it uh, at the end of the month. There's several, four different options that you have there. Uh, if you would, Mr. Mayor and Council, save any questions of staff till after the public hearing. All right. Thank you, sir. All right. With that. Thank you, Mr. Harmon. We'll move, Madam Clerk. Mayor, we have one speaker, Mr. Gordon Rose. Good evening, Mr. Rose. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of Council. My name is Gordon Rose. I'm an engineer with the firm of Gradient. Uh, offices at 230 Donaldson Street here in Fayetteville. We're doing the site design work for this uh, property 
It is an expansion of the existing Bobcat facility, be a new building, expanded sales and service. The main, <clears throat> excuse me, the main reason for our request for annexation is to tie into the public water and sewer. And as a part of this project, we will be extending uh, PWC water line along Angelia M Street. As Mr. Harmon mentioned, this will uh, result in increase in taxes for the city of Fayetteville. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rose. Madam Clerk. Mayor, we have no further speakers. All right. All right. So with that, I'll open and close the public hearing. Uh, Councilmember Davis. Yes, sir. I'm ready to make a motion if there's no questions. Okay. Seeing none. Yes, sir. All right. I move that we adopt the annexation ordinance with the effective date of June 24th, 2024. All right. It's motion by Councilmember Davis to approve the uh, annexation request and adopt the ordinance. It's seconded by Councilmember Banks McLaughlin. Uh, any discussion on the motion? All right, Council. I look to you for your votes on this. Councilmember here. I vote green, Mayor. All right. Madam Clerk, that is unanimous. All right, moving to 8.02, proposed amendments for the hospital overlay plan. Mr. Harmon. Mr. Mayor, let me get that next PowerPoint up for us. So as part of your consent items tonight, you already adopted a rezoning uh, along uh, Village Drive, uh, the north side. These were all properties that are currently owned by the uh, Cape Fear Hospital. And this is kind of a, a second layer uh, to that rezoning. Uh, it's a text amendment to our, uh, our hospital area overlay, uh, district and plan. As you all know, there's a lot of plans in the works uh, with Cape Fear Valley Hospital, uh, and so this is to help facilitate uh, some of what they're attempting to do out there. Um, so again, uh, we do have the, these, the purpose of these is to streamline the development process uh, within the HAO. Uh, and foster expansion of Cape Fear Valley Mel Medical Center and associated uses in the future. Um, so the area that's highlighted here is the area that's covered by the hospital area overlay plan and the overlay. Um, and the area that we're looking at tonight uh, is this area on the north side of Village Drive. Uh, a lot of these properties are currently owned by the uh, hospital. And so uh, we went through the rezoning process that you approved earlier. And now with the text amendment, uh, it's basically two different uh, things with the text amendment. So uh, first is changing the purpose of the uh, plan and the overlay. And currently the overlay states that the purpose of this uh, overlay is to protect uh, single-family residential housing around the hospital. Uh, what we've done is tweak that a little bit uh, because really the purpose of this overlay is not only to protect the residential around, but also to help foster the ability of the hospital to grow. And so we've added that into the purpose. And that's what you see on this slide here. Um, the other thing that we've done is that uh, currently along Village Drive, uh, it restricts this plan and the overlay restricts certain types of uses uh, along Village Drive. And what we've re at right now is just all of Village Drive from Conover to Roxy. What this revised part does is take that and make it only on the south side. Uh, so that the north side where the hospital is allows the hospital to expand. But then you've got Roxy Avenue, you've got uh, Village Drive, which is five lanes through that area to serve as a buffer to the residential on the other side and help protect that. So, 
<clears throat> so those are really the two things that uh, these two text amendments do tonight. And again, they do allow align with city goals and it's uh, supporting economic development and growth, uh, creating vibrant communities, more walkable, and uh, leveraging the hospital as a strategic asset of the city. Um, again, benefits to the hospital, it simplifies the development process for their expansion enhances uh, the adaptability of future health care needs, but also uh, continues to protect those surrounding neighborhoods. Um, tonight, your options are to approve as presented, uh, to approve uh, some of, uh, remand back to staff for changes, or recommend denial. We are recommending approval of the uh, proposed amendments. Um, that's all staff's presentation at the moment, uh, Mr. Mayor. If, if you would hold any questions of staff till after uh, you conduct the public hearing. All right. Thank you, Mr. Harmon. So with that will open the public hearing, Madam Clerk. Mayor, our first speaker is Mr. David Sumner. Good evening, sir. Mayor, City Council, I am David Sumner. I'm the project manager for Cape Fear Valley Health System over on the campus. And tonight we come to you to say thank you for a collaborative partnership that we've enjoyed for many years as we grow and expand the services in the community. And we thank you for considering what's on the table tonight as we continue to do that. And I, I'm speaking on behalf of the executive leadership of the hospital as well as our own Board of Trustees. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. All right, Madam Clerk. Mayor, our next speaker is Mr. Mackley Sellers. Thank you. Uh, it's Macklin. I don't know how I got in there, but I, uh, I am Bo. Uh, if you see me on the street and want to speak, that's fine. Um, I appreciate David speaking first. He's my project manager. Um, we want to thank you again for your assistance uh, in helping us grow at the hospital. Um, your recent uh, rezoning is where we're adding our current vertical expansion on the corner of Owen and Village Drive, as well as we plan uh, staff parking along Village, as well as the new School of Medicine. Uh, in partnership with Methodist. So I want to say thank you again. I appreciate all the help. City staff has been very helpful to us to understand what we need to do and, and to move along. And if there's any questions I can ask, I'll be glad to answer them for you. All right. All right. Thank you, thank Mr. Bo. All right. Um, Madam Clerk. Mayor, we have no further speakers. All right. So seeing none, I will close. Well, I did have one question, Mr. Harmon. Is it, it? I heard you read in there that the, you added the uh, the additional goal was for growth of the hospital. Is it healthcare okay. system or healthcare related growth, or is it just specific to hospital expansion? It's uh, related to all the expansion that you're looking to do out there. Uh, as they mentioned, there are the, there's the daycare they're expanding. There's the new medical school. Well, the reason uh, I was asking, there may be yeah. some support industries that, that grow as they add the medical Correct. school. And so then, I just don't want to have limitations on no. future growth creating. A no, it, it's medical related gotcha. type stuff. Okay. And I will add to Mr. Mayor and council that uh, with the uh, approval earlier of the rezoning and the approval of this, TRC has already uh, approved with the caveat that they get this approval tonight their site plan is already approved through TRC. So they're ready to move on this if Good. if everything's approved. All right. Thank you, sir. Uh, Councilmember Green. I was going to make a motion. We good? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, these changes certainly fit into the strategic plan for economic development and future use and future growth. And it's wonderful to see our hospital growing like it is and new um, training and everything 
it's for the region. So with that, I would like to make a motion to approve the proposed amendments to the hospital area overlay and plan as presented. All right. There's a motion by Councilmember Green, seconded by Councilmember Davis. Any discussion on the motion? All right, seeing none. Council, I'll look to you for your votes. Councilmember Hare. Mayor, I vote green. Okay. All right, Madam Clerk, it looks like it's unanimous by those voting. Thank you. Tell Mr. Nagowski we say keep up keep up the good work. So we appreciate it. All right. So with that, I'll pass the gavel back, and I think <laughs> this is the actual item. Yes. All right, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Harmon, 8.03. Yes, thank you, uh, Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, our next case, uh, public hearing, is 2422. This is a property uh, located uh, out on Cedar Creek Road, uh, 1666, 1674 Cedar Creek. 1678 and an unaddressed parcel on Fields Road. Um, just under uh, 28 acres, property is owned by Cedar Creek LLC. And this is in District 2. Um, here on the map you can see uh, the area that this property is located in. Um, there is one property here on the corner that the front part of it is already in the city uh, and this little part back here is part of that property is not in the city currently so this is all an initial zoning that you're looking at first and it will be tied to a later annexation request um, this is across the road from the locks creek uh, subdivision uh, that you see here and as you'll see in a minute a little commercial area here along cedar creek road as well uh, our current zoning uh, in this area, uh, you do have uh, commercial zoning here in front, some more commercial zoning uh, here across Cedar Creek Road. Uh, you're probably, most of you familiar or all of you familiar with this property, uh, which has a planned uh, Fayetteville fire station uh, on it. Uh, and then again, we're looking at this uh, cluster of uh, properties here in the back. Our land use plan does currently call for this to be uh, mostly low density residential with some office and institutional on the front. That's the blue you see uh, all along Cedar Creek Road. And these are a couple of pictures of the uh, existing property. This is actually the property that's uh, partially already in the city. Uh, and then the back of this property and back over here, what's being uh, looked at in this uh, annexation and rezoning. Uh, around the property, you have some undeveloped areas, you have some, and some commercial, and then also some single family as well. <clears throat> um, while this is not a condition, uh, this is a conditional zoning, and while the site plan itself is not a condition of uh, one of the conditions set out. Uh, what the owners have done is conditioned this down to no more than 300 units on the property. Uh, under MR5 uh, not being conditioned, they could do over 600 technically on the property. Um, this is the site plan that they have submitted uh, that has gone through one round of review with the city's technical review committee. Um, these are photos submitted by the applicant uh, showing typical elevations of apartments uh, similar to what, uh, what they've do in the past, done in the past and are looking to do uh, at this location. Again, it is a conditional uh, rezoning. Uh, the development would be of no more than 300 residential units. 
appears to, uh, appears to fit with the growth needs of the area and the city as a whole. Site location is on a underutilized major thoroughfare according to DOT traffic counts, which does make it ideal for multifamily development. The area's suitability rating for residential development also points to this area being appropriate for residential densities of more than those allowed in low density zoning. Uh, and that Fayetteville has an ongoing Locks Creek drainage improvement project in that area as well. Uh, the Zoning Commission and city staff both recommend approval of the uh, MR5CZ on this property or mixed residential five conditional zoning. Uh, the purpose of the zoning amendment implements policies adopted in the city's future land use plan, including uh, future land use and strategic plans and policies found in the UDO uh, with an update to the future land use plan map to reflect uh, the changing conditions in the area, this area of the city. Uh, the use is permitted by the proposed uh, change in zoning uh, district and classification uh, are appropriate for the immediate area uh, of the land to be reclassified uh, due to the surrounding properties and that there are no other factors that substantially affect uh, public health, safety, morals, general welfare. Uh, and then we've got Mayor Pro Tem, that uh, concludes staff's presentation at the moment. If y'all would hold any questions of staff until after you conduct your public hearing, we'd appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Harmon. And with that being said, I'll open up the public hearing. Mayor Pro Tem, our first speaker is Mr. Jonathan Charleston. Good evening, Mr. Charleston. Good evening, Mayor Pro Tem. Um, I also have uh, Victoria Clarkson here, I think, who's going to yield her time to me. She's one of my co colleagues at the Charleston Group. Is that all right? And Mayor Pro Tem, I'm going to be very brief and reserve the majority of my time uh, for rebuttal. Excuse me, Mayor Pro Tem. Just wanted to note that it doesn't appear that um, Attorney Clarkson is signed up. Well, then, do I get the entire 15 minutes? We have some other, we have Darren, some other speakers, was, sir. Uh, I'm sorry. Darren Collins has signed up, and he yields his time to me. Okay. Thank you. All right. Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm going to be brief tonight. Uh, I believe that the staff has done an excellent job of addressing why it makes sense for this zoning to, uh, uh, to occur. But before I get started, uh, I'd like to approach and you know, when this property was acquired by the current uh, owners, the sellers of the property were very concerned about what would go on that location. And consequently, uh, the sellers required that there be restrictive covenants placed on that particular property. And what I'd like to point out, the, the, the manager is passing out to you all a copy of the restrictive covenants that are on this land. And this is important for a number of reasons. I'm going to try to read this without my glasses. So. Just, just think about this. When I first started presenting to city council many years ago, I didn't, need, I didn't need glasses, I didn't need contacts, I didn't need anything. And I started representing folks before the city council, and I ended up with gray hair and blind. So he, here we are. Uh, what I'd like to point out to everyone on page two, does everyone have a copy of the restrictive covenants in there? In the highlighted portions, it states that uh, residential and multifamily uses shall be permitted provided that such use is consistent with and permissible under the zoning regulations at the time of the execution of this amendment, this document here, um, provided, however, that no such single or multifamily uses shall be for low income or affordable housing. That wasn't the current owner's requirement, but the sellers would not sell the property without that restriction. So. There were questions. The reason I'm bringing this to your attention is because initially at the Zoning Commission meeting, there was discussion that this was 
going to be affordable housing in that area. The city needs affordable housing, but there's a difference between affordable housing that receives a subsidy and just affordability issues, people being able to buy houses. And I will say, ladies and gentlemen, I remind you time and again that the city is about 20,000 units short. What the demand is for in this community now is multifamily. Servicemen and women, the younger generation, tend to be more inclined to look for multifamily apartments, rental options, as opposed to purchase options. But what I wanted to point out here is that the family that sold this property essentially has the opportunity to say no as to what goes out there. And so the whole idea was to make sure that the development is consistent with and in harmony with the existing uses. Why is that important, you ask? It's because the family that sold the property continues to live there. And so they want to have some influence over what happens in that area. Second point I'd like to make, ladies and gentlemen, is that uh, with the assistance of Council Member uh, Davis, uh, we had a meeting with the community on Saturday at Fire Station 5. And one of the things that came up was that it would have been a good thing if we had had that conversation that we had Saturday a lot earlier. But what we know was of major concern is the issue about potential flooding in that area. And what I remind Council of is this. All you're being asked to do is to rezone the property to allow development up to what uh, you know has been called for in the recommendation. Before anything can be constructed on that site, you know the city and other regulatory uh, bodies having oversight with respect to stormwater management, site plans, and the like have to sign off. And I would be hasten to point out to you. In the technical review committee, I believe it said specifically that uh, um, the recommendation, uh, the approval would be subject to, among other things, the city engineering department's approval of requ uh, would be required prior to the issuance of building permits. I don't have to tell you guys that. I know you know that. But out of an abundance of caution, I thought it important to bring that out. There was some discussion about the fact that this uh, development is in a, in a watershed and that this project is, uh, is, has well-documented water quantity problems. And so consequently, stormwater control is going to be important. So the city of Fayetteville's professional staff uh, will work with the developers to make sure that the stormwater management plan is appropriate. And uh, also, DEQ will have some say in that as well. So I want to make sure we pointed those things out. Um, other than the fact that in the appeal, there were some objections uh, raised in the appeal. One of the things I will hasten to say, as much as I like to get out of those meetings quick, the Zoning Commission was generous enough to give the opposition an additional 20 minutes uh, during the Zoning Commission, an additional 20 minutes to make sure that all their points were able to come out. Because I believe that it's important to make sure that the neighbors that you're going to develop, to develop in and around have an opportunity to voice their concerns. So I was glad that the Zoning Commission let those things come out. And what we continued to hear was that there would be traffic problems as a result of a development like this. Well. You know, there's no data to support that. In fact, the data suggests, suggests just the opposite, that there will be school crowding. Well, ladies and gentlemen, you know the schools don't come until they are crowded, right? I mean, they don't build schools before they have a demand for it. There was a lot of talk about crime and, uh, you know, the kind of crime that comes with multifamily. Uh, and, and I understand that. People feel that way uh, a lot, not in my backyard. But the fact is, there's no evidence, none whatsoever, that a multifamily development results in crime. If that were the case, then all the nice developments throughout the city, and there are some nice ones, you know, would, uh, you know, would just be crime-ridden. So what I will say, and uh, before I sit down and, and take my seat, is that 
this location is appropriate for this type of development. I would encourage you to look at what's happening between where this development is proposed to go and where Interstate 95 is going. All right, you have a hotel that's converting to multifamily. Why? Because there's demand for it. You have other hotels that are looking to come out in that area. Why? Because we have 295, which is going to be a real jewel for this region that's coming out there. So you're going to have people that will have ready access to the base from the south side of the city. And, uh, and hopefully, if, if the other interstate concept that's being batted around comes, there will be an additional growth on the south side. And in fact, I believe your strategic plan looks for affordable options for housing to address the fact that we're about 20,000 units short. So ladies and gentlemen, I'll pause now, reserve the rest of my time for uh, rebuttal. I'm not asking for 20 minutes, just whatever the balance. And I'll certainly take any questions if there are any. Thank you, Mr. Charleston. Thank you, Mayor. Um, is this Deputy Clark? Yes, ma'am. Um, our next speaker is Mr. Tom Lloyd. Good evening, Mr. Lloyd. Good evening, Mayor Pro Tem and Council. I'm not here in any formal capacity, hence the business casual tonight. I'm just here to explain the relevance of the 2030 plan uh, and I'll, I'll be real quick because I was playing director for the county at the time that plan was done it was a cooperative effort between Hope Mills the county and the city of Fayetteville and that plan really laid out uh, areas where your MIA standards would be granted in the county in so the city wouldn't have to retrofit when they um, annexed so this area was designated as urban by the city and the county and home mills the collaborative effort it was in 2009 you had the employment generating centers out at, uh, at exit 49 the new newly located industrial park downtown so um really this led to the or um helped with the mia standards so that the county would put in place mia standards looking to the future that this would be urban development uh, so recognizing that it would have sewer had water water and sewer if i was asked if it was in the county and now if it had sewer of course it would be going into the city but it does work that way with hope mills um, but if with water and sewer and somebody went and applied i can tell you this based on that plan which the county would still use because the cedar creek road area has not been uh, redone that area plan hasn't been redone yet um, and they went the the staff would recommend and probably the planning board and I'm also chairman of the planning board actually now um, for what mixed use development essentially what the city's equivalent uh, equivalent to the city's MR5 so I I'm just up here to say that the 2030 plan was an effort back in 2009 of the city and the county to cooperate and pinpoint this area for urban development. That's all. Thank you, Mr. Lloyd. Yeah. Mayor Pro Tem, our last speaker in favor is Mr. Darren Collins. Okay. Mm -hmm. Our first speaker in opposition is Mr. Robert Naylor. Good evening, Mr. Naylor. Evening. Uh, hello, I'm Dr. Robert Naylor, and I reside at 1997 Water Oaks Drive. I'm located directly behind the property. I'm very familiar with the land and the flooding concerns that I personally witnessed uh, from the flooding damage in 2018 with Hurricane Florence. Uh, this property is surrounded on three sides by low-lying, swampy areas and is located in the mandatory evacuation zone during any major storms. Locks Creek is directly across Cedar Creek Road. Uh, the previous owners wanted the developer to build single family homes and stay consistent with the surrounding area. 
After months of negotiations, the family finally sold after the developer showed them plans to build a combination of single family homes and townhomes with attached garages. It is now obvious to the family that the developer has misled them with his intentions and they are appalled by his current plans. Mr. Charleston has many times mentioned the restrictive covenants on the property. What he fails to disclose is that the only two of the current or previous owners uh, live in the area and they are in their 70s and older age and they may not be up for enforcing any restrictive covenants in the future because of their age or if they were to move away. Uh, Mr. Charleston has repeatedly stated that landowners have the right to use their land to the highest and best use. Well, that is not always true if it comes at a cost to the neighboring community. What if I wanted to build a outdoor shooting range on my property, which is right next to this? I'm guessing he would not support my highest and best use for that. And Mr. Charleston consistently references a 20,000 unit housing shortage. Well, the developer is apparently having difficulty selling the house that they recently remodeled that's located at the front of the property. So I guess they're having a little trouble selling a house knowing that there's gonna be an apartment complex built right in the backyard. And with that, I think that rezoning will have negative impacts on home values in this area. An apartment complex does not fit the current landscape of single family homes and farmland. And I believe it is not in the community's best interest for the mayor and developers to work together on personal projects. From the builder's perspective, it is smart to have the mayor as a business partner on a project that will require the city's approval to move forward. How can the mayor have the citizens' best interests at heart when he has a personal financial stake in this project? This rezoning sets a dangerous precedent for all future land development. We ask the city council to deny the rezoning request and keep the community intact as rural residential. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> Mayor Pro Tem, our next speaker is Mr. Jeremy Stanley. Good evening, Mr. Stanley. Good evening. Uh, Jeremy Stanley, 2313 Cleveland Avenue, Fayetteville. So, Mr. Charleston said that I needed to get my facts right on Saturday. So I wanted to make sure I got them all right on, uh, he keeps saying that there's a 20,000 unit shortage in Fayetteville, which he's used on another property in 2020 to have it re-signed um, for the investment group that he was representing then. So as of right now here in Fayetteville, there's over 3,100 apartments available for rent on rent.com and Zello. As far as homes for rent is, there's over 700 homes for rent. Now on Fort Liberty, there's 9% vacancy for single family homes and 7% vacancy for apartments for the service members. So I'm not quite sure where this 20,000 magical number keeps coming from not including the 125 apartments that are coming into the Holiday Inn right there on Cedar Creek Road, plus the 500 plus apartments that are already um, proposed for the pickleball fields right there at exit 49. Now that's not including the over 25 plus new subdivisions that's been put out there. So our school out there is already overwhelmed with 1,583 students at Cape Fear High School this past year when the school's only rated for 1,100. These are all factual numbers that each and every one of y'all can look at. 100% go online and look. I don't think this should, should be approved for the community whatsoever. Not only that, it only has one grocery store out there, which is the IGA, which is a, beside another apartment complex. Now, the only thing that I did see that there was a shortage of is the affordable housing. There is a waiting list of over 500 that they're not even taking applications for affordable housing in Fayetteville. This seems awful suspicious, but I don't have any facts to say any more to that because of the contract. But Mr. Naylor did touch on a few bases that could be suspicious to that. So with that, I don't think it should be approved at all. Thank you. Thank you.
Mayor Pro Tem. Our next speaker is Mr. Brandon Perdue. Good evening, Mr. Perdue. Hi, ma'am. How are you? Um, so I just want to pause and, and not start yet until he kind of hand, hands those out. I understand you won't really be able to look at those while I'm talking, but um, they support the comments I'm going to make. And those slides were in the packet that I sent each city council member. So if you had time to review that information, you've already seen those in a smaller, smaller version. So, okay. Um, my name is Brandon Perdue. I reside at 1531 Cedar Creek Road. So I'm actually on Cedar Creek Road. Um, thank you for considering my statements. Um, just my background, I'm a colonel and an engineer in the United States Army. Um, I have experience in city master planning in Iraq and as the senior project engineer on several projects on Fort Liberty to include the 82nd Division Headquarters, uh, the 82nd Division Chapel, and the 108th Air Defense Artillery Brigade Complex. So I have experience in planning and development. Bottom line up front is this proposed rezoning does not conform with Fayetteville's 2040 comprehensive plan its future land use map, its residential suitability map, or commercial suitability map. Um, it further does not conform, despite what the gentleman just said, with Cumberland County's future land, land use map. And those slides are in there um, in support of those statements. You can look at them. In the City Council action memo, the City Senior Planner assigned to this case incorrectly states in his report that these properties are in the medium to medium high rating for residential suitability. That is factually incorrect. They are in a low medium rating for residential suitability. That's one to four dwellings per acre. At the proposed 300 apartment plan, that would be 11 dwellings per acre, which is in the upper range of a high density residential suitability, which is five to 16 per acre. Um, also want to talk that the, uh, the city's 2040 comprehensive plan, um, they, they note that it shall be advisory in nature um, that's true, but on the city's website, it states that that plan is the primary tool for decisions regarding rezoning, um, and it had information received from public input and the use of best planning practices. So while it is advisory, it is the primary tool for these types of the decisions. Um, let me get to my last point. That three minutes goes fast. Okay, the last thing I want to address um, is in the packet, there's a, a section called consistency and reasonableness. Um, so this proposal is not compatible with the local area and is not in a key identified area. It will have a detri detrimental impact on the roads, utilities, schools, emergency services, and the environment. It is not in a designated area, is not strategic, and does not create well-designed and walkable areas, which they state it does. Um, the proposed designation as requested will permit uses that are incongruous to those existing on adjacent tracks, and it does not address any needs in this area, and it opposes modern land use trends and patterns. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Mayor Pro Tem, our next speaker is Ms. Channing Purdue. sticky notes on them to make sure I knew who.
right, thank you. My name is Channing Purdue. I live at 1531 Cedar Creek Road. I also own properties at 1304, 1538, and 1535. I'm here to talk about the flood risk. After Hurricane Florence, the previous councilwoman for District 2, Shaquille Ingram, filed for a moratorium. It's to temporary stop, temporarily stop the building in Locks Creek subdivision. This was to be temporary until a strategic stormwater plan was made. The council denied it without any further inquiry or discussion. Despite Mrs. Ingram's, doc, Ms. Ingram's documentation and the testimony of the citizens affected, including myself. There's also a code of ordinance in the city of Fayetteville that prevents flooding damage. And I quote, no proposed encroachments would not result in any increase in the flood levels during the occurrence of the base flood. This means that no project is to cause further flooding to any areas surrounding it. Locks Creek drainage improvements. I would like to point out that this was recently updated after I made a big stink in February and March at the zoning councils, and there is now bids being put in. Um, estimated bid was May of 2024, and the um, amount of construction costs is 8.8 .8 million. This was not in there six months ago. That is all I have to say other than I do not approve the annexation and rezoning of this property. Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem, our last speaker is Ms. Janine Ackles. Good evening, good evening. I too have to put on some spectacles to see a little better. <laughs> My name is Janine Ackles and I reside at 1684 Cedar Creek Road. My home is a directly adjacent to the proposed property and apartments. Um, I'm not gonna go through and repeat everything that everyone said. I'm gonna go through and just kinda just finish up with a few thoughts because I wanna appeal to you in a way that you understand us our residents and our community, the people that brought, put every one of you all in. So thank you for this opportunity today to speak. I'm just here to address a pressing concern. It's regarding the mayor's involvement in our current decision making for this project. It's a clear conflict of interest for the mayor to be a part of this process. We don't have any objections to him being a part of land development, but for this particular um, project, it is a conflict because he often has to rely on the city council members to vote in his favor. This dynamic, it just raises serious questions about the fairness and impartiality of our governance. Where does this leave our residents? Even though the mayor has recused himself from voting, the optics still favor him. This perceived favoritism undermines the trust we as citizens have in our local government and it's essential that our decisions reflect the best interests of our entire community, not just those with political influence. I urge you today, the council members, to just rec reconsider and think about this before you vote. Many of these residents have already endured flooding and lots of damage to their properties because of what has happened to them before in the past with these environmental issues. So let's ensure that every decision that is made for us is made free from conflict and interest, conflicts of interest, and truly represents the voices of all of our residents. And lastly, just to let you know, this plea is not personal against our mayor. We as a community are simply asking for consideration of our investments, which include our homes and properties as well. Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem, we have no further speakers. Thank you, and with that, I will close the hearing. Up, oh, you ready? He has a rebut. Um, city Attorney, we good? Okay, I opened it back up. I'm going to be very brief, and uh, as I stated before, uh, one of the great things about the meeting that we had on Saturday was uh, the opportunity again to hear what the folks in the community had to say. But there are a couple of things we need to 
point out that are real. First, the city's professional staff would place requirements on the development of anything on that site. You can't build anything on the site unless you have the approval of the city engineering staff and DEQ. So the one thing that folks don't say to you, because maybe you know they're not in that situation, but when developers buy property to develop, they have all the risk. The risk that the zoning won't be approved, the risk that you won't get the required permits to build what you want to build, because right now, you know, all of the risk is on the developer. All we're asking you to do is to rezone and let the professional staff put the requirements on that lot, uh, on that acreage that they have to, that they will put on there. The professional staff, the professional staff that you've hired has indicated that the proposed rezoning is consistent and reasonable. The traffic counts from the state of North Carolina say that this is a not a very highly utilized roadway, that being Cedar Creek Road, so it could absorb 300 units out there. There's references that there is going to be an impact on emergency management. No, no data, just folks saying that. And so there's no data to suggest that. And the 2040 plan and all land use plans are just that. They're guides, ladies and gentlemen. They're guides. I served on the planning board for many years here. So, I mean, I know just what Mr. Lloyd said. They're guides, and they guide development. What I will say uh, t today that and I, I take exception to a representation by the gentleman that there was anything misleading uh, to the family. I take very strong exception to that, and I would encourage you to look at the restrictive covenants, and I would encourage them because I gave them copies of this. It's a public record of what the restrictive covenants say. It says that the sellers, the sellers have essentially veto authority over what goes there. In fact, one of the sellers was at the meeting on Saturday. The gentleman that made that representation wasn't there, and if he had been there, he would have had a better understanding, maybe. So what I will say to you is simply this. The sellers negotiated a transaction that put limitations on what could go there because they had an interest in not only what was going to be developed near them, but as one of the sellers said on Saturday, they had an interest in what was going to be developed that would impact their neighbors. And so what we know is that the family gets say over what goes there. It has limited what can go there. I won't go through it, but it's in the highlighted portions, ladies and gentlemen, of the restrictive covenants. That would be in addition to whatever zoning classifications and further restrictions that would be placed on the property. Uh, finally, I would say that um, let's not you know, get caught up in conspiracy theories. That seems like where America is going these days. Let's just keep it factual. Let's keep it factual. Let's keep it factual. There's no moving the ball. What we were asking for is a rezoning and it's going to be subject to whatever requirements and restrictions that the engineering professional staff places on the project. And I thank you, and I'm here to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, Mr. Charleston. Um, sir, I'll let you go. You want me to address the gentleman? Yes, ma'am. Okay. How may we help you, sir? We have three minutes left, so you can pick one speaker to speak for the group.
There's time left. There's 15 minutes per side. There's time left. There's 15 minutes per side. Welcome back. Thank you. So again, Clark's Brandon, running. Brandon Purdue, 1531 Cedar Creek Road. Um, in the packet that Mr. Naylor gave you, there's a letter from Mrs. Aber, who was one of the sellers. I encourage you to look at that and look at her comments. Um, in regards to the, the Zoning Commission Board, y'all recall that the first time we went before the Zoning Commission, they voted four to one in, in opposition of the rezoning. Um, we came to City Council, it was pulled. We went back to the Zoning Commission Board and they voted four to one in favor of it. After the meeting, I asked Mr. Patel, who's the chair of the commission, why he changed his vote. And he stated that the uh, applicant had a technical review committee um, done. If you read that, which is in this, this case, um, it is all standard comments for apartments. So regardless of where you're building the apartments, the comments that you see in that, you would see in any other TRC at this point. It's all, all copy and paste, with the exception of the one section where it talks about the, the storm water and that this is a, a known flooding area. And it just says that it may require further um, engineering and things like that to deal with that. Well, I would propose to you, based on Mr. Charleston's comments and the fact that he talked about the professionals will make sure that you know, they do their job and that the stormwater management and all that stuff is in place. Every building that ever gets built has to have that done. Anything that does, Locks Creek. So if, if the professionals never made mistakes, then we wouldn't ever have any flooding. Locks Creek gets flooded all the time, not just in, in major storms and that had to have a TRC and a stormwater management plan and all of that. Professionals make mistakes. And make no mistake, if these apartments get built, it will cause flooding. It will worsen it for us. During Hurricane Florence, I was carrying goats off of my property in knee-deep water because we are upstream in the tributaries. We have drainage ditches that run through our project into Locks Creek that go into the Cape Fear River. This is downstream from us and it's gonna flood us worse. So just because professionals really view it and do their job, I'm not saying they're, they're wrong or they're bad, but people make mistakes and projects get approved because of political influence, financial influence, and those things. Right now in the back of Locks Creeks, there's four houses built on stilts because of the known flooding in that area. And that will continue to happen. In regards to the underutilized highway, I live on Cedar Creek Road and we judge how weekends are going by the number of sirens we hear on Friday and Saturday night. If this is built in conjunction with the apartments proposed at um, exit 49, it will double more than 10,000 more cars per day on Cedar Creek Road. Double the current use according to the city planner's numbers. Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem Jensen, um, the applicant does have two minutes left if it wishes to use that time. Thank you. Okay, with that being said, I will now close out the hearing. All right, so I will go to Councilmember Davis. Thank you, uh, Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, first off, I'd like to thank the residents who came out on Saturday. Um, we had a meeting with uh, the applicant and kind of worked a little bit of things out. But um, thank you to the uh, residents who came and Mr. Charleston for coming and being willing to meet with the residents. So my first question is for the Mr. Charleston, if you would come to the podium, sir. Good evening, sir. How are you? So the the um, conversation Saturday was respect the land, okay? And so, you know, under uh, the code of ordinances for the city of Fayetteville, we have um, a list of things that you can do under MR5. And some of those things are um, a youth club facility, a community center or a swimming pool or other things. And so my question to you or for your clients is that, is there any potential to do anything else besides um, the units that you guys are trying to build on the property? Now this this is a, a conditional zoning, and so the site plan that's being submitted is for the units that we intend to put there. But in the discussions with the um, with the sellers of the property, 
uh, there was some discussion about uh, activities that might support um, uh, uh, multifamily living, whether it be uh, you know church activities, a daycare, or something like that that might support it. But uh, I can't say what the developers have in mind other than what is being uh, submitted to the city for review. But what I will say is that the, uh, again, what we're asking for, uh, Councilman, and you heard the discussion on Saturday, and I thought it was a very good discussion uh, with the people that were there on Saturday, is that the, the issue had to do with uh, managing the water out there. And I think that that rests soundly with your professional staff and uh, the North Carolina Department of Environmental Quality, DEQ. They're gonna do their job. Uh, if we don't have any confidence in our professional staff or the state regulators, then you know it's just going to be chaos anyways. But what we have is professional staff that are paying very close attention to this, as are the, the neighbors in the community. So I would submit to you that, again, the request is simply the rezoning. The development of the units that are requested may or may not happen depend on, what, on whether or not the stormwater can be managed. You guys have been here, you've seen that thousands of times before, where professional staff comes in and says, well, you know, we can't make that work. We're gonna approve something lesser. So all the risk is on the developer. And what I will say, ladies and gentlemen, and I hasten to say this, but increasingly it's very difficult to develop in the city. And consequently, what we have seen in the last 10 years is all of the other urban areas having explosive growth from 29% to 4% in Cumberland County. And one of the reasons that's the case is because it's so difficult to develop here. Now, what I would suggest in this case is you have a planning staff, you have a professional engineering staff, the TRC, let them do their job. They're here to protect the public. They are public servants. Let them do their job and everybody will be fine. If, if, the, if they come back and say that the project can be developed, then so be it. If they say it can't be, then that's the risk that the developer has assumed from the beginning. That's part of that. That's just the risk they, they assume. Okay, thank you. Um, don't leave yet. I have another question. Um, so we, uh, you gave us a copy of the restrictive covenants. Yes. And what I know about restrictive covenants is that they are um, restrictive and they are attached to the land. And so they're attached to the land and the owners have possession of those restrictive covenants, correct? Now, the, 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 the restrictive covenants run with the land. Right, they're attached to the land forever. But in this case, the restrictive covenants are a burden on the land right. for the benefit of the folks that sold the land. Right. They can enforce those restrictive covenants. Their heirs and assigns um, can enforce that. And the gentleman that drafted those uh, uh, restrictive covenants uh, is a member of the family, a well-respected lawyer here in Fayetteville, and it was insisted upon. There was no negotiation about single-family housing out there. It was always multifamily, and uh, those restrictive covenants uh, are going to limit what happens. The Architectural Review Board has four people. Two of the people on the Architectural Review Board are from the family that sold the property. The remaining two members of the Architectural Review Board are the current owners, but it takes 51% to get a project approved. If it's not 51%, that means that one of them has to agree, then the project concept is not developed and the restrictive covenants will keep the developers from doing any of those projects. Got you. So at what point will the structure, architect structure, come before the architectural committee? Is it during the process? Because you know that was a question on Saturday. Yeah, At absolutely. what point does the um, architecture come before the architectural uh, committee? Yes, uh, great question. Uh, what was done is we took it before the TRC because really and truly, it doesn't matter what the developer and the family agree to. If mm -hmm. TRC says we're not gonna do that, it doesn't matter. So we went to the TR Technical Review Committee first, but it still is subject, whatever we put there is subject to review by the architectural review panel. So it takes 51% or the development does not get done. Okay, my last question, um, Council, is 
are there, I don't know if this question would be for our staff or maybe you can answer it. Yeah. Um, has there ever been a feasibility test done? And at what point is it required for this property for a feasibility test to be done? Feasibility for what purpose? To test the soil to see if the property can hold well, that's up. That's a great parking. question because what I will say to you is that in order for a project to get financed, the banks require uh, soil testing. And if the project will not, I mean, if the soil, the environmental issues will not support the project, the banks won't provide any financing for it. That's a, that's a requirement that's normal, everyday stuff when it comes to you know, financing capital projects. So there are a lot of hurdles that the developers have to uh, overcome. And that's why I say they have all the risks. They have the risk of approval from the uh, Architectural Review Committee. They have the risk from you know, the regulators, that, you know, whether or not they can build up to 300. It might be much less depending on how the stormwater management is. But all of the risk is with them. And I think that the professional staff, the engineers here, will uh, manage and put certain restrictions. And you all have seen that before in a number of other areas where stormwater management has to be approved, the plan has to be pr approved. The city staff uh, does that, and DEQ weighs in on that because stormwater is a big issue. All right, appreciate you, sir. Mm -hmm. There's no other questions. Thank you. Maybe mm -hmm. Thank you, Council Member Davis. Council Member Benavente. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Um, Mr. Harmon, I have a few questions. You uh, showed us a slideshow, and um, one of the bullet points for analysis says that Fayetteville's ongoing Locks Creek Drainage Improvements Project it just sort of says that. Could you speak more to what that means? I am not part of engineering, so I don't have a lot of expertise on what that project uh, entails exactly, but I do believe that we may have uh, Byron uh, here with uh, stormwater management who may be able to say a few words on that, just what the project is. That'd be great. Thank you. So the question's about the Locks Creek <clears throat> drainage improvement project. That's correct. Okay, so kind of the scope of work, and this, this is a project that was developed out of the citywide watershed master plan. It, it was brought, presented to council I'm approved by council to move forward to project development, but essentially the scope of work of that project is um, we will be upsizing the culvert on Locks Creek Road and raising the profile of the roadway structure of Locks Creek Road. Uh, the drainage improvement project does not uh, address any of the flooding concerns from the primary system from Locks Creek or the tributary. Um, what it does is it provides ingress and egress to the community in the Locks Creek subdivision. There are several properties in Locks Creek that do not flood. However, if you get certain storm events, uh, they lose the ability to get in and out of um, the neighborhood. Um, I had two other questions. Um, again, whether that's um, Mr. Reeves or uh, Mr. Harmon, uh, a comment was made about a $8.8 .8 million figure um, that I guess was previously you know, not present, but maybe in response to some of the concerns has been allocated. Could you speak more to what that was? Okay, so when we presented the uh, proposed solution for um, Blocks Creek, uh, the planning level estimate for that project was around $8.8 .8 million. Uh, however, once we've got into detailed design, survey and design, uh, the project is, is estimated to be around $850,000. So it's not $8.8 .8 million. Okay. That was what was presented to council as our planning level estimate. And, you know, I think a common um, thread amongst um, f opponents of this particular project was about the potential or, in their opinion, inevitable increase in flood levels to the area. What exactly is the process should that occur? You know, if w we are assuming that um, development is going to happen here responsibly, DEQ is going to be involved, um, you know, things are going to be put in place, and with every box checked, with every I dotted and T crossed, you know, we're five, ten years down the line, and we have those storm events. I mean, is there 
um, precedent or in the past when, when it comes to things like this, uh, how we address that type of issue? Or is that sort of impossible to say what the source was? Because it could be just a one in a hundred year storm. And um, is there really any way to tie it back to saying that it had to do with the development? Um, so you have storm frequencies of different different levels. Um, so let me just make a clarification between yeah, please. DEQ and the city. Um, the city has a more restrictive storm order ordinance than um, say if somebody developed out in the county and sure. had to, to do under DEQ. Storm order essentially uh, from the state standpoint is a water quality issue. Um, with the city of Fevel, uh we do have uh, provisions that address water quantity. Um, so essentially if you have a vacant lot like this is, uh, if a de proposed development is 20,000 square foot of impervious surface or more, that triggers your stormwater requirements. So they would have to submit for an infrastructure permit where we look at stormwater and, and other things, sidewalks, um, driveway permits, right. things, things like that. But as it relates to the stormwater, typically your ordinance uh, would uh, call for, let me see if I can read it correctly. Um, Stormwater management facilities would have to be installed to limit the one year and 10 year develop peak discharge rates from peak development discharge rate. So essentially what you're, you have your site and I don't know how large the, the parcel is, but uh, essentially if it's a vacant lot, you have a certain amount of stormwater that runs off. Any proposed development would have to be equal to or less than, than that runoff for your ordinance is a one or 10 year storm event. So that okay. whether that's here or anywhere in town. Um, we, in your stormwater ordinance, you do also have a provision for areas that have well-documented flooding issues. Locks Creek obviously has well-documented flooding issues where we can do more restrictive stormwater requirements. Say instead of that one year and 10 year, we can up it to a 25 year, 50 year. So what, what, what's feasible, but at what point are, are the gains? And, and that determination that you just described happens at what point? Uh, when they would submit. So um, I think they came into TRC back in May um, and we provided those comments that it would likely be a 25 year storm event is what they would need to, to design to. Very last question, council, thanks for your patience. Uh, Attorney Pulliam, I, I, I feel like I've done a lot of reading when it comes to our SUP um, process um, and you know reasons to approve or deny projects and you know some of the legal basis for doing so and also what opens us up to you know um, litigation as well um, how closely are those concerns in uh, in this case with the zoning matter um, they're they're almost completely different okay. whereas with the SUPs it's quasi judicial you have those standards you have to make findings for those standards here this is legislative. Council can approve or deny for any reason. Okay. Thank you, Councilmember Benavente. Councilmember McNair. Thank you, uh, Mayor Pro Tem. I would like um, the person that handed out these to come to the podium. Yes, ma'am. I think it's on the uh, second page. A letter from. I think one of the sellers. That's correct. The previous owners, the sellers. Oh, oh okay, okay. Can you uh, explain why you um, has give, have given this to us tonight? Well, it's primarily in the fact that um, you know they, like Mr. Charleston said, they have a big concern for the community. Uh, two of the siblings still live there. There's five siblings that inherited this family land. They're the only two that are in the area. The other three are out of state. Um, one of them is very elderly, he's 85. Um, and I think they had a sense that they wanted to sell the land before this got passed down to their children and it just became a more and more of an issue. But the reason for this letter was, she had written this letter up um, for the expressed intent to show that this planned uh, apartment complex was nowhere on the radar of their negotiations and what they were talking about from the get-go. That um, it was a complete surprise. When I showed them the first uh, map of the uh, 300 apartment complex, they, the two owners, the two previous owners literally 
put their hands on their head and just said, oh my goodness, what, what is this? What is this? They were completely sh uh, shocked and surprised by it. Thank you, sir. Okay, so um, I, I I really don't have a few. I don't have any questions right now because I have been studying this very hard, and I just feel like I need to say some things. Um, so, for those of you that are part of the development, and those of you that are the residents around there, I, I want you to know I am sitting here on this podium, twelve years ago, kind of the same thing was happening in my neighborhood. And that what that is what brought me to be on the city council, is that I saw how things went, and you know, being on here, I have learned a lot. I've learned a lot. So, what I will say is, um, in my neighborhood, they were putting up four hundred some houses, one way in, one way out. Hurricane Matthew hit. Hurricane Florence hit. Um, the flooding was unbearable. It tore down the whole week. No way in, no way out. We were locked in. Since that day, we still have one way in, one way out. But we have also approved over 300 new homes to go in there. And let me tell you why. What you have right here is, is that you have someone that is has a covenant on this. And the question that I'm asking is, is if this does not go through and the family is gonna sell, I understand I've learned a lot today through everything that y'all are talking about. My understanding is that a 70 year old is probably the youngest in the group. Say he passes away, 10, 15 years from now, we know they want to sell. What is going to happen then when you have no covenants and you have no say? And I've seen it happen up here time and time again. So I, I guess I, I understand the frustration, but this covenants is, is gold. And when I will say that to you is, in my neighborhood, before I got on council, they said, the city came in and said, we're going to give you another way out. We're going to put a street over the dam, and we're giving you a way out. Our neighborhood came out, screamed, hollered, and said, don't ever come back here. We like one way in, one way out. Five years later, Hurricane Florence happened. Guess what happened to the dam? If they would have approved it for the city to come in and do that, it wouldn't have been the neighborhood's responsibility for that dam. The city would have owned it. So now we are here 15 years later. I'm fighting like a dog to get an extra exit out. We have another 150 homes coming in, but the builder that has come in has said, I'm willing to work with you. I'm going to make it as good as I can for both of us. And I think at the end of the day, having this is kind of something that you have a voice instead of someone that comes in and buys it and says, I don't care. They're not from Fateville. They're not don't have to see you in the grocery store every day. So I really think that you really need to think about that. And then my next question is, and I don't know who this question is to, but if this does not get passed for, the, for this, my understanding is you can, you can build under the county regulations. And I know, I know Council Member Hondras will tell you up and down, we are one of the only cities in the state that has stormwater prevention, stormwater unit that comes out. Their stormwater for the county is nothing compared 
to what happens in the city of Fayetteville. So I really, I understand, I fully understand, but it's not just somebody building and leaving. You have a covenance here saying, you can do this, you can't do this. So I just felt like I needed to say that out. So with that, I will go to Council Member Hondras. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, I am indeed a big fan of our stormwater department. Um, so I don't know if staff can answer this or not, but to the best of my knowledge, so the City of Fayetteville stormwater ordinance requires a minimum 10-year design. Um, I think the county's is one to two year. Um, I don't know if anybody here can confirm that. Byron, of course, is getting that. So the county doesn't have permitting authority for stormwater. Um, that would fall under the state. So DEQ would be the permitting authority if you were to develop outside of the city limits in Cumberland County. Um, those stormwater requirements would be the state minimum, which is, uh, as I said early, earlier, um, related to water quality only. They're worried about total suspended solids, nitrogen, and phosphorus uh, entering our waters. Uh, the City of Fayetteville Stormwater Ordinance is more restrictive. We, ha we have to meet the state minimum standard, so the d design standard for anything in, stor in stormwater in the city would have to meet that one-inch storm for water quality, but we also have to limit the peak discharge for one to ten years, and in cases where you have documented uh, watersheds with uh, stormwater issues, we can require um, stricter restrictions. So the county, I don't know if the county even has a stormwater department but they are not the permitting authority for stormwater it would be the state right no they were uh there was an interlocal agreement with the city and then so the, our permit mpds permit with ncdq is a phase one permit right when they opted out when the state gave that option so the state does the phase two permit so we do quantity and quality they just looking at the at the quality side the environmental quality side is what you're saying correct Gotcha. Thank you, sir. So um, that being said, Mr. Uh, Madam Mayor Pro Tem, um, so as I've stated in other cases, your schools and your roads are always reactionary. NCDOT is not going to build a super highway and wait for development, nor is the city. Uh, same with schools. Um, you address those issues and improve them once once the safety needs improving, once the um, capacity needs improving. Um, I think we've addressed most most everything. I mean, as far as the development goes uh, for density, strictly looking at zoning, talking about uh, walkability, I mean, that uh, property, Cedar Creek Road, is on the bus route uh, right off the interstate, less than a quarter mile away. It fits all the parameters. When we talk about, I think, um, safety was mentioned, um, the city of Fayetteville plans to put a firehouse out there. I think it's firehouse 16. Th these are all things that will enhance it. All the development, I think, um, council members from that district have advocated for uh, parks and rec enhancements east of the river and, and that side of town. Rooftops are the catalyst to all of that. So with all that being said, um, I mean, I'll yield to my colleague from District 2 if he chooses. If not, I'm prepared to make a motion. Would you like to make a motion, um, Council Member Hunters? I move that we approve the map amendment to MR5CZ as presented based on the evidence submitted and find that the map amendment rezoning is consistent with the future plan of the city demonstrated by the attached consistency and reasonability, reasonableness statement with an update to the land use plan to reflect this map amendment. Second. That is a second from Council Member Hare. Council, I ask for your vote. Any discussion? I'm sorry. Okay, I ask for your vote. Council Member Hare? Green to approve. Um, and I think I'm missing one person. Who am I missing? Okay. All right. That is four to three. 
five to three, I'm sorry. Please keep your comments to yourself. Thank you. We're going to take a five minute break.
All right, we're going to call the meeting back to order. So let's go to 8.04. Mr. Harmon. Thank you again, uh, Mayor Pro Tem uh, and Resident mm -hmm. Council. The last public hearing that uh, Development Services has this evening is an annexation request, A2402. Um, this is related to the rezoning request that you just heard on Cedar Creek Road. Um, it is owned by the same group, Cedar Creek Road LLC. <clears throat> uh, four properties located along Cedar Creek Road, uh, just under 28 acres in District 2. Uh, just a reminder of kind of the area that we're looking at uh, on Cedar Creek Road and Fields Road across from Locks Creek. Uh, this is your annexation exhibit. Um, it has gone through uh, our property management division uh, with the city and they have found uh, the property be sufficient for annexation, meeting the requirements of the ownership. A uh, couple of photos of the property, uh, the house on the corner that's already in the city and then some of the property uh, and the property behind it is part of the annexation plus this uh, property below. Um, <clears throat> more pictures of some of the subject properties actually kind of behind these buildings. Uh, and then over on Fields Road. Um, then we have uh, some of the properties uh, surrounding, including some commercial, some single family residential, and some uh, undeveloped. Uh, again, this is a this one is a map showing uh, the water and sewer in the area. Uh, the professional planning staff does recommend that city council move to approve the uh, draft ordinance uh, annexation 2402 at 1066 uh, 1666 1674 Cedar Creek Road and. Uh, 1678 Fields Road and an unaddressed on Fields Road. Uh, the petition does meet the requirements of North Carolina general statutes. Real Estate Department again has verified uh, the sufficiency. Uh, departments and divisions report that they can uh, absorb the expansion uh, of services with uh, minimal additional resources. Uh, and the annexation uh, will, in, will lead to a increase in property taxes uh, in the future. Um, with that, that would conclude the staff's uh, presentation at this point. If you would hold any comments or questions for staff till after the public hearing. Thank you, Mr. Harmon. And with that, I will open up the public hearing. Mayor Pro Tem, we have two speakers. Our first speaker is Mr. Jonathan Charleston. Good evening again, Mr. Charleston. Good evening. Uh, we respectfully request uh, your consideration of approval. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mr. Darren Collins. Is Mr. Collins not here? left the building okay with that I will close the public hearing I look to Councilmember Davis thank you Mayor Pro Tem I, I don't want to uh, keep beating a horse but I do want to reiterate um, for our aspect of attorney if we don't annex them in they can still build to county standards and county standards are not as restrictive as city standards correct um, if they're not annexed in, they can still build to the county standards, yes. Right. I'm not familiar with the county standards. Right. But they're not as restrictive as the cities, maybe? I do believe that the density would be different. And, I, again, I'm sorry that I don't know what the county standards are. It's okay. All right. So, um, uh, Council, I do see fitting that the annexation happens so that they can build to city standards and not county standards, which also gives another layer of protection um, for the property. So um, whenever the motion is ready, uh, whenever the time is ready for the motion, I'm ready to make the motion. 
All right. Thank you. Um, Councilmember Hondras, is that a question, a comment? Well, I, I was prepared to second. Um, I think to um, Councilmember Davis's question, and Dr. Newton could probably speak to this best, but I, I think it would be appropriate to say the city has higher development standards in the way of stormwater, landscaping, sidewalks, just about all of it. But um, either way, I'm prepared to second the motion whenever we get to that point. All right, um, Council Member Davis. All right, um, I move to adopt the annexation ordinance with an effective date of June 24th, 2024. Could I get a second? And that would be second. Council Member Hondras. I'm, I'm sorry, Council Member Hare. Um, Council Member Hondras got, got it first. So if I do I have any questions, discussion? All right, I call for the vote. I vote green, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Council Member Hare. I am missing. Oh, that's it. Oh, that's right. Okay, that is eight to zero. Thank you, Council. With that being said, I ask that um, the Mayor and Council Member Green please come back to the podium. All right, thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Council. Um, moving to the next item, which is 9.01 fiscal year 24 25 budget ordinance and adoption of fee schedule, capital project ordinances, amendments, and special revenue amendments. Mr. Yates. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, given the late hour, I will be brief. What you have in front of you tonight is the culmination of the budget process that was started early on. Um, I can tell you everything has been submitted in accordance with the general statute, public hearings held, and tonight you have the ordinance in front of you for adoption. The primary pieces, key highlights, the uh, ordinance in front of you adopts a tax rate of 57.95 cents. That's a four cent increase for the general ad valorem for the municipal service district, an increase of seven cents to 17 cents. Um, a $1 increase in the stormwater monthly rate and a $10 increase in the solid waste rate. Um, includes market and pay adjustments fully funded by that tax rate increase for the uh, valorum of about $11 million for public safety, a 4% merit increase and in increase of 4, 1% for, for the 401k. And you have $2.3 million of direct funding for OCS with an additional $2.5 million of OCS-like activities. As you can see here, these are the parking lot items that you approved with the consensus at our last work session. And these are all factored into the ordinance in front of you tonight. And we had our increases in the CIP, and those are in accordance also with our last work session. Um, this is how we balanced. We were able to find some one-time money in the CIP to prepay some debt. We um, also froze the FPD vehicle replacement for one year. We used a little bit of reserve capacity that we had set aside for council. And then we have um, increased the vacancy assumption and then a few corrections. So with that, oh, I'm going the wrong way. Sorry about that. I will give it back to you, Mayor. You have a balanced budget in front of you tonight for your consideration. All right. Uh, do we have a question for Council Member here? Thank you, Mayor. Um, just, a, just a couple of questions. Um, on that 500K for our pickup of our thoroughfares. I guess clarity for me personally is let me understand what is the approved, what is what are the improvements uh, with this 500K? Uh, how many pickups would it be? Uh, how further does this take us than FY20, uh, the presently FY24. Uh, thank you, Councilman. That's a good question. This $500,000 additional is to maintain the current service levels that you have in FY24. As we went through the bu um, budget process, um, these were, this was the one of the things that was reduced to try to bring the budget in balance. 
and our recommendation was that if we added back or, or the council so had interest was to add that back so that 500,000 is just supporting current operations at the current level with the litter pickup crews and right away maintenance okay okay I was I was hoping that it was carrying us a little further as we look at the four cents that is added for our public safety for our police officers with all of the discussions that we have had about uh, supporting our police and raising their salaries um, for this particular but for this particular budget season and I know there's been some changes in uh, what the increase would be to what the proposal is now does this increase still get us to those conversation items as far as their raises and I don't have I don't I can't see it I don't know if it was either to 50 K or 55 K something in that range to raise our officers please yes sir explain. so what this what this increase does for public safety is it gets your starting pay up to 50 uh, just a little over 50,000 close to 50,500 it also does the compression adjustments related to that as well as provides putting all of those positions on the step they otherwise would be if you match steps and years. So this invests about $11 million overall in additional compensation to PD, as well as straightens out in the short run, the market issue, and in the long run, the steps issue as council has articulated their desire. Okay, and my final question, Mayor, um, we are to have a, uh, a budget done by the 31st of this month does those salaries and all of the uh, proposals that we have go fully in effect on the 1st of July? Um, actually, the, uh, Fayetteville has a history given the time frame it takes to put those into place. They go into effect on August 1st. August 1st. Okay, yes, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Yates. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Yates, I did have a couple questions uh one as a result of council member Hare's question uh so when you brought us this budget you took out litter pickup and then this, if you put it back it looks as if we added it i'm a little disappointed in that um so what was included was the extra overtime crews for litter pickup and the right additional right away maintenance mowing this would have cut us back to just the required sequences um, based on the conversation with Michael and where we thought council was, it was our recommendation, um, even after we, after we got the budget balanced, was that if council desired to put that back, this would be the first thing we'd recommend adding back. I mean, again, uh, I don't know that it was highlighted. It was removed. I think they did the same similar kind of thing to OCS initially during the budget meetings. It was... We'll include last year's. We'll take it out, but when we put it back, it looks like we put in, put in uh, the 250. Um, you know, as you look around at the quality of the city, the trash is something that I constantly send pictures on, and I know Mike and them do what they can within the the, the constraints of the budget. But I, I'm not sure there was a uh, will from anybody to to take and go back to DOT's minimum quarterly pickups just on their highways, leave and city streets you're, you're correct, Mr. Mayor. It wasn't, and the $500,000 didn't roll us all the way back to that. Huh. Um, one of the things that, um, Jeff, um, that we've covered in the budget work sessions uh, with council up to the, tonight, where we're hopeful that you will adopt the budget, is that we were able to trim some $8.1 million out of the budget, and we shared that list with the council as well. This on top of $9 million of less tax revenue that we received because of the sales tax agreement with the county. In addition to that, the recommended budget that I proposed had a five cent increase re recommended in it. And again, as Jeff said, with your support and, and council's guidance, uh, we were able to reduce that to four cents. Um, simply put, we have frozen we are delaying replacement of vehicles. We are doing a hard freeze on some critical positions in the city. And the budget that we have is very um, austere and ambitious. The items that you have in front of you 
And we're able to also do that by pulling out an additional $2.3 million for OCS. The $500,000 was identified early on as to what it was. And we also balanced that as we shared um, in the budget work sessions that we had set aside $500,000 for council to add something back and that was the first thing that we put on the parking lot because we understood council's interest in it. But to get to the balanced budget originally and to make sure that we took care of what council's number one goal was, which was the recruitment and retention of public safety staff, that is more than $10 million worth of salary increases that we have proposed and council has approved if you adopt a budget with a four cent tax rate increase that generates about six million dollars. So four million dollars additional money we had to find in the budget to support the police, fire, and 911. A loss of nine million dollars in sales tax revenue, cuts of more than 8.1 million dollars to the budget, freezing critical positions, um, I just want to say to Jeff and Kimberly Leonard and to the council, thank you, because I don't know how we did it. Um, the challenges continue to get heavier. Next year, when we are here and we're discussing this, we will um, hopefully have um, new tax numbers, and the challenges will just seem like they're getting greater. But what is in front of you is a continuation of services and uh, there's also, I think, Jeffrey, the second line on the parking lot was $100,000 for beautification and spot repair. And I make the same commitment to you, um, well, staff does, to the council, as we always do. When we get to the year and we run out of money for beautification or for demolitions or any sign replacement, and that was one of Councilman Beher's uh, concerns as well, we will alert the council at that point in time. We hope their revenues come in stronger than what we've um, anticipated, and we will bring it to council's attention, hopefully for a reappropriation of additional funds. But simply said, this has been a very, very challenging year, particularly given um, the need to find and fund um, the much needed um, and well-earned increases for the public safety staff and general employees. All right, Councilmember Thompson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Mr. Hewitt, I'd just like to echo that. I'd like to thank you and your staff for bringing us a balanced budget. But I'd also like to mention what you failed to mention was that we are also frozen 35 police officers' positions to help pay for some of their step increases. I think it's a well-deserved raise as our crime rate is going down and our homicides is going down. We need to also applaud our first responders as the fire department and the police department. Uh, you guys did an outstanding job, and I'm, hopefully this incentive will give us some retention and some recruitment incentives so we can help uh, enhance our force with numbers. Uh, on that note, Mr. Mayor, I'd like to motion. If it's, uh, yeah, I'll see one more okay, question. Mayor, Councilman I'll Benavente, then I'll circle back to you. Oh, Councilman Mahondros, too. He's tucked in down there. Yeah, I just wanted to take an opportunity to thank um, all my colleagues here. Um, I know it's been, you know, sort of an up and down um, journey getting the Office of Community Safety established. Um, you know, um, we've gotten folks yeah. who come in. <laughs> we've had some folks who come in, you know, um, you know, give us our kudos. We also had folks who come in and give us grief as well. Um, but I think through it all, you guys looked at the data, you guys looked at the information, and we all collectively came to um, a decision that uh, we can improve on public safety here in the community. Um, and I just wanted to say that, you know, as much as it is that the city has alternate response, it's going to be because of every one of you on this dais. So thank you. All right, Councilman Mahondros. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Yates, I have a, a question regarding the parking lot items. On the uh, the first one's the 500,000 for right-of-way maintenance. The second one's major corridor purification. Looks like 50,000 and then another 50,000. What was that one I, I, I have in a brain? Sure, lapse. There was. there's a word cut off, so I apologize. It's 50,000 for spot removal and 50,000 for contingency. So this is for um, additional corridor cleanup and additional corridor work as needed. Okay, so it's just more right away cleanup. It can be for a variety of items, as the mayor pointed out. It's a priority for council to work in those spaces. Thank you, sir. And Mr. Manager, did I hear you say the uh, sales tax revenue 
um, not realized in 2024 is on pace by the time we finish up the month here in a few days to be around $9 million. Correct. At this point, of course, we still have about a quarter left of, to, of receipts. Right. So we won't have those actual numbers till like September, September. But, but but we're on pace to be over nine million. Okay. Because I had a little debate uh, with uh, some of our county partners about whether it affected our 2024 and 2025 fiscal year, and they said it didn't go into effect until 26. And I had to remind them um, that, to the best of my knowledge, it was capped at the 2022 figure, and it was in fact going to cost us some money. And uh, I'll be uh, very curious to see exactly what it costs us so I can uh, go back and share that with them. Um, Mr. Mayor and Mayor Pro Tem and, and my colleagues on council, um, I, I think those of us that were here last year knew this was, last year was hard. <laughs> I, I think we knew this year was gonna be hard. Um, I do commend staff as the manager and my colleague already stated um, to get the all of us when we ran ran on public safety whatever public safety means to you um so to get to make public safety and get our first responders uh, as my colleague eloquently put it previously not all that they want but all that they deserve um to be able to fund the office of community safety that we've worked on for better part of two years now um you know, if, you, if we poll our residents and ask them, hey, would you all be ecstatic about a ad valorem tax rate increase? Nobody's going to say yes. But in 2016, in 2023, um, they convincingly told us that they're willing to pay a fair share for additional services. So um, am I ecstatic about this budget? No. You know, am I... Uh, ecstatic about a four cent ad valorem increase? No, but to be able to get all that we accomplished in this budget with a, I forget, 15% efficiency in 24, 19.8% efficiency in 24, and then an additional 8%. So you're talking 25% efficiency uh, over a two year period. Uh, it'd be easy for me to let you all. Uh, in consensus pass the budget and me vote against it just because I typically don't like tax increases, but that would also be the cowardly thing to do. Uh, so I'm prepared to support this budget when we get there. Thank you, Councilman Mahondras. That is uh, <laughs> that is a surprise, you know, but we know you're a fiscal responsible person and you uh, have made your points. Uh, again, uh, before I go to Councilmember Thompson, well, I'll say Councilmember Green, so I'll save my comments to the end. So I'll go to Councilmember Thompson. I was ready to make the motion. Oh, okay, let me go to Councilmember Green, then I'll be back. As the new kid on the block, or one of the new kids, Councilmember Davis and I, this was a very difficult process, and I knew that it was going to be that coming in. And I am most appreciative of the staff's willingness to answer questions and receive our questions over and over and come back and answer more questions from those questions. So it, it was a very difficult task and I've worked on a lot of boards and a lot of groups across the city, um, but this was a very challenging budget. And I've actually worked on PwC's budget before, so um, this was even challenging in a lot of that. Um, maybe because PwC has a lot of money. Um, but um, <laughs> Glad to hear you say that. You're Former welcome. Former commissioner. <laughs> I figured that everybody Let's was see. doing so well tonight, I would not stop the train now. Um, with that being said, I'm going to do something in District 5 that hasn't been done in a while. I'm going to actually vote on the budget. Whoa. Is this snowing outside? What's this? <laughs> Well, listen, uh, before I go to Councilman Thompson again, just to echo, I uh, don't want to belabor this, but uh, it, for the listening audience, um, this council did not take lightly um, or they took in consideration every impact that we could think of to provide the services that you're accustomed to. I mean, we sent them back over and over again to find other ways to do it, to be conscious of the fact that people are recovering financially and economically. Uh, but you still want service and you want to feel protected. And so I would like to commend uh, Councilmember Thompson and other colleagues who were very adamant to make sure that we maintain a competitive rate for our police department uh, and our, our first responders that, uh, that 
issues that had existed uh, from previous years were addressed uh, with, with, with staffing and, and compression. Uh, and staff stepped up. And so, Mr. Hewitt and to uh, Mr. Yates, we appreciate that. Um, and so please know, uh, take solace in knowing that this council worked very hard over multiple meetings uh, to get to a point that was that we believe was a, was a good balanced option. You know, we don't have the option like the federal government to, to pass unbalanced budgets and to, to figure it out after the fact. We had to balance it, and we've done that. Uh, so I do commend my colleagues and the manager and, and his team for that. So with that, I'll go to Councilmember Thompson uh, for. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Councilman, oh, Mr. Councilmember Davis, and then you told me you wanted to. I'm speaking. Okay, all right. So Councilmember Davis, then Mayor Pro Tem. Did you have something? No, I was making a motion, but you got something. Oh, okay. Um, of course, like Councilmember Green said, this is my first budget, but I do want to thank staff for all your hard work and. Um, as I advocated for um, more code enforcement, because we get code enforcement calls almost every week, um, I think it was important to get more staffing for code enforcement. Um, but I am ready to discuss next year's budget, because there's some things that I want to see more happen in District 2. So I'm excited about it. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Jens. So I will be quick. Um, I, I do want to say that um, this has been a, a challenging budget. But I do appreciate everyone sitting up here because the worst thing that you can say in an elected position is it is what it is and walk out. And we did not do that. We worked really good as a team and I appreciate staff that there were a lot of questions that were asked. Um, there was a lot of meetings. And everybody showed up to the meetings and showed real concern, especially of our public safety. So before I, I end, I do want the public to know we are raising the taxes, the four cent, but we are also out looking for grants and it is consistent with our staff. And if you ever see anything or ask about a grant, this or that, staff can pop it off right there say we're doing this we're doing that and i will tell you that is something new and exciting for the city of fateville that we have been working on for the, probably the past eight years probably past eight years so it's finally coming to fruition so we are growing and moving forward and i would really like to personally thank staff and the council thank you thank you mayor pro tem councilmember banks mclaughlin would hate to be the eyeball. <laughs> no, but um, seriously, to our um, staff, thank you for um, implementing our ask um, and for the community. Thank you for your input. And I would like to thank um, our staff, too, for even coming out to our community watch meetings and having um, meetings to express uh, some of the concerns and some of the things that the city is facing and some of our accomplishments. So I do want to thank you all for um, just being able to um, inform the community of what's taking place. It's one thing to increase taxes. Um, nobody likes an increase, um, but it's for a good cause. We all know that the city is ran off of taxpaying dollars. So if we want the services that we um, need and deserve, we have to increase those um, Taxes and council is uh, good working with you all. Um, we've uh, accomplished a lot, and we still have a lot of work to do. Thank you, thank you, Councilwoman. All right, Councilmember Thompson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. It's just one final word uh, for all the residents out there. I just want everybody to know that this four cents, a hundred percent of it, goes towards public safety. And I want all of our constituents to realize that it doesn't matter where we live, what amenities we provide. Whatever your financial status is, none of us are safe until all of us are safe. So let's make that first and foremost so we can have a safe community in the city of Fairville. And on that note, Mr. Mayor, I'd like to make a motion that we approve this amended uh, 2025 uh, budget of almost $321 million. All right. There's a motion by Councilmember Thompson. It's seconded by Mayor Pro Tem. No. No? Mr. Hare? Mr. Hare? Okay, and uh, all right, uh, so a second by you, Council Member here. I probably second it, sir. Okay, Good job well done, a lot of hard work. All right, so seconded by Council Member here. Uh, we've had discussion, Council. I look to you for your votes. 
Wow, we got a unanimous budget. <laughs> Councilmember Hare, it's your pleasure. Yes, sir. My vote is First time I've seen that in about six years, so congratulations. <laughs> Uh, well, uh, before we before we do the motion to adjourn, Councilmember Harry, you said you had a question about ten point oh one. Oh no, sir! If you're going to call for uh, the adjournment, then I'll stand down. Okay. All right, Mr. Hewitt, did you hear that? What is ten oh one? Okay. All right. Um, so. That is going to a work session. Uh, any consensus needed by you, Mr. Hewitt, or you got it? All right. So, council, motion to adjourn? All right. Have a good evening.